Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video which is going to be addressing the Van Allen radiation belts. This is probably one of the most commented topics across my videos, not just on videos that I've done about the moon landings, but even regularly gets brought up on videos where I tackle Flat Earth, because, you know, Flat Earthers by default have to reject the moon landings because of the photos that were taken of the globe. Although it is worth noting that even though all Flat Earthers deny the moon landings, not all moon landing deniers are Flat Earthers. I only bring that up because often I get comments on videos that I do about moon landing deniers where people are calling them Flat Earthers, which often isn't actually the case. However, the argument that people put forward about the Van Allen belts is claiming that humans can't pass through them, so therefore the moon landings must have been faked which simply is not the case, and in this video we'll aim to cover the main reasons why, and also why, in my opinion, the whole idea of using the Van Allen belts as evidence against the moon landings is quite bewildering. Ultimately, I think some people just hear the term radiation and immediately picture the likes of Chernobyl or the atomic bombs, forgetting that whether or not radiation is deadly depends on the strength of the radiation and how long you're exposed to it. Radiation's kind of like education in that regard, like how today's sponsor Brilliant.org can give you a steady stream of bite-sized learning each and every day, with hundreds of classes across a wide range of topics, and it doesn't matter if you're completely new to the topic or you already have a solid grasp to it, there's something for everyone. The best part about Brilliant for me is their use of interactive animations that I find makes the topics much easier to understand and visualise. I use Brilliant daily, often when I'm sat just having breakfast. My daily streak is now approaching 400 consecutive days. Try it for yourself by taking a 30 day free trial using my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan and anyone who does so will be eligible for 20% off an annual subscription. Now, in the late 1950s, with the push for space growing between the US and the Soviets, both sides began launching satellites. The Soviets with Sputnik 1 and 2, and the US with Explorer 1 and 3. With these being the start of scientists basically being able to test space. They contained equipment to measure how much radiation was up there, and the data that was collected began to paint a picture of what became known as the Van Allen belts, named after Dr. James Van Allen, who is credited with discovering them. But what are they? Well, the sun emits radiation right across the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves right through to gamma, and it also emits particles as well. All of these get flung out across the solar system, some of which will inevitably find their way towards Earth. Now, surrounding Earth is our magnetic field, so as the Sun's radiation approaches, it will pass through this magnetic field, and so can become trapped. The strength of the magnetic field reduces the further away from Earth you go, so further away from Earth tends to be lower energy particles that get trapped because these need less force to stop them, and the particles with more energy are generally able to pass through these higher areas without being stopped and can make it much closer to Earth. So usually they're seen as two distinct belts, although in reality the belts are forever changing. You can have periods of high solar activity which can increase the size of the belt, sometimes creating a third belt that bridges the gap between them, and sometimes solar winds can blow the particles away which reduces the belt size and density. But for the sake of argument, let's just stick with two belts. The inner belt starts around a thousand kilometers above Earth and it reaches out to around 12,000 kilometers. The outer belt runs from around 13,000 to 60,000 kilometers. And so conspiracy theorists argue that these belts would be deadly to humans and so impossible for anybody to actually reach the moon. Now, firstly, consider the belts similar to our atmosphere. They are not fixed in density throughout. The inner belt is denser than the outer belt, and the highest density of the inner belt is found around 3,000 kilometers above Earth. Beyond that, the density gradually decreases, similar to the density of our atmosphere. And the radiation doesn't completely cover Earth. It's not the radiation layer. They form around 30 degrees latitude north and south of the equator. Hence, they look like belts going around the Earth. So the amount of radiation within the belt varies a lot depending on where you are within the belts. Then there's the factor of shielding. 
Now, I have a lot of people, when bringing up the radiation belts, argue that the moon landings must have been faked because the spacecraft didn't have thick lead walls to protect the crew. Except an important thing to remember is there are different types of radiation. Thick lead is needed in things like nuclear reactors to block high energy gamma waves, but we get sunburned because of ultraviolet radiation, and that can be stopped just by a thin layer of fabric. And as we've already covered, the radiation belts aren't primarily waves, but rather particles, specifically alpha and beta. Alpha particles are blocked by as little as a sheet of paper, and beta particles by not much more than that. Being exposed to beta particles would fry our skin, but they wouldn't be able to penetrate deep enough to reach our internal organs. So a few centimeters of aluminium significantly reduces how much radiation could reach the crew. Now, Scott Manley has a fantastic video on this topic where he shows computer models of the exposure based on the actual radiation data from the belts as well as the impact of shielding. I'll link it below so you can check it out. But the key takeaway from it is the absolute worst part of the Van Allen belt is in the middle of the inner belt, about 3,000 kilometers above the equator. A human being just floating there in that region by themselves, no spacecraft, not even a spacesuit, would receive deadly levels of radiation in less than one hour. But with shielding equivalent to that of the command module's hull, it would take several days for the crew to receive deadly doses of radiation. Now, not only were the crews through the belt within a matter of hours, but they didn't even go through that worst part of the belt. Like I said, the worst part is about 3,000 kilometers above the equator. But to go through that would require the spacecraft to be orbiting around the equator, which the Apollo missions didn't do. Here is the orbit chart for Apollo 11. This shows their ground position from launch into a parking orbit around Earth and then ending where they begin their translunar injection burn, after which is when they gain enough altitude to actually start to get into the Van Allen belts. And you can see the orbit reaches more than 30 degrees latitude. If I transform this map into a globe, you can see clearly that on this orbital inclination, the spacecraft would be well above the northern hemisphere when reaching the kinds of altitude of the inner belt, and so would completely miss the bad areas. You can even see from the photos taken of Earth as they were heading away from it, they are well over the North Atlantic, nowhere near the equator. And we can see the same from Apollo 17's famous blue marble, with their outbound trajectory putting them above South Africa, way south of the equator, and able to see Antarctica. And this, for me, is where I think these claims about the radiation belts are rather bewildering. And I'm going to cover it from two perspectives. Flat Earthers and people who know the Earth is a globe but still deny the moon landings. All bearing in mind with this, James Van Allen discovered the belt in 1958, a full decade before Apollo 8, which was the first time humans went beyond the radiation belt. Now, flat earthers not only argue that the moon landings never happened, but also claim that space doesn't exist, or that at least there has to be a physical barrier between us and it that would prevent us from ever getting to space. Well, no space would mean no radiation belts, meaning NASA would not only have decided that they were going to fake the moon landings, but then also decided they were going to invent these radiation belts as well as an extra hurdle to overcome for absolutely no reason. I mean, there is no logical reason why NASA would invent radiation belts that didn't exist as an extra problem to solve in an already giant conspiracy. Global moon landing deniers, though, at least accept the existence of space and the radiation belt, but are of the belief that they would prevent humans from actually reaching the moon. Now, as we've already covered, the belts themselves aren't as deadly as some people believe, and the areas of the belts that could cause a problem were avoided, and instead the spacecraft went through much weaker areas of the belts. But now let's imagine for a second that humans couldn't survive at all in the belts, not even in the outer edges. Well, they would still be belts. They loop around the Earth like donuts, meaning the northern and southernmost areas of Earth have no belts above them. If the belts were that much of a problem, NASA could have put Apollo into a polar orbit, looping north and south over the poles, which would then mean the translunar injection burn would send them cleanly above or below the belts and avoid them altogether. 
In reality, NASA didn't do this because getting into a polar orbit requires more fuel than one closer to an equatorial orbit because it doesn't take any advantage of Earth's rotation, but it would still be doable. So they could still get past the belts entirely if necessary, rather than only missing part of the belts by using their 30 degrees inclined orbit. But then the reason that people think that NASA faked the moon landings was so that they could claim the bragging rights over the Soviet Union. Well, if the belts were actually impassable to humans, the Soviets would have known that, so the moment America claimed they'd landed on the moon, the Soviets could have instantly called BS on it. Not only that, but NASA would have known that the Soviets couldn't have got there either, so neither side could actually be the first to the moon. They would have given up trying. It's why nobody's going to try a race to land humans on the sun, because it's not possible, and any attempt to lie about it would immediately get called out by every other space agency on the planet. Although in reality, the Soviets not only knew about the radiation belts, they also knew the belts weren't a deal breaker for getting to the moon. In September 1968, two months before NASA sent humans beyond the belt, the Soviets launched Zond 5, which was the first spacecraft to pass around the moon and return to Earth, and was also the first spacecraft to send living things out there as well, because on board were numerous types of organisms, including two tortoises and several insects, as well as also carrying a mannequin with radiation sensors. This mission was specifically done to test the effects of radiation on living organisms and compare them to control subjects that they'd kept on Earth to ensure that it was possible for humans to travel safely to the moon. And the Soviets' conclusion were that humans could comfortably survive the trip. I mean, to put it into context of just how survivable it was, the Apollo crews were in and out of the belts within a matter of one to two hours. As stated before, the belts center around the equator and can reach out to around 60,000 kilometers. Every geostationary satellite is parked around 36,000 kilometers above Earth and directly above the equator, meaning every geostationary satellite spends years non-stop inside the Van Allen belt, filled with equipment that would be susceptible to radiation. However, only a small amount of shielding to protect them, and they're good to go. Speaking of protecting equipment, many people often bring up a video called Trial by Fire talking about the Orion capsule, and apparently NASA admitting that they've never been beyond the Van Allen belts. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. For this flight, it's time to head home. Except people seem to overlook. This was a brand new spacecraft, so obviously it needed to be tested in exactly the same way as any new model of car goes through crash tests, even though the older models work perfectly fine. And especially since the modern computers on board Orion will be more susceptible to radiation than the old hand-wired computers used in Apollo. The last thing anybody would want to do is send humans up there and then find that the computers get fried because of radiation and they lose all the spacecraft controls. Now that Orion test flight that they're talking about was EFT-1, launched in 2014, and that reached a maximum altitude of 5,800 kilometers. And then obviously a few years back, they did a second test flight as Artemis 1, which went all the way to the moon. But they did similar testing with Apollo. Apollo 4 and 6 were unmanned test flights, reaching altitudes of 18,000 and 22,500 kilometers respectively well into the radiation belts, and with equipment on board that measured the radiation inside the command module. So NASA already knew what to expect before they even put humans into space in that command module. So no, the radiation belts are not a deal breaker for getting to the moon. You could sit for days inside the worst part of the belts, whereas moon missions avoided the worst parts altogether and only spent a few hours inside them. The radiation that they were actually exposed to was less than the annual health and safety limit for nuclear power plant workers. 
If the bells were such a problem, they could have avoided them by flying a polar orbit. If avoiding them wasn't possible, then the US and the Soviets would have been in a stalemate. And then there is the flat earth conundrum of if you're going to fake going to the moon, then why also fake the existence of something that's going to make that task so much more difficult? Anyway, that's going to wrap things up for this video. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.